Good afternoon. A very warm welcome to one and all for joining us through this uh, web link for the colloquium of uh, today. We are indeed very privileged and honored to have Professor Pankaj Joshi with us to talk to us on a very uh, in a topic of very contemporary interest. And uh, uh, it was it has been very nice talking to him. Uh, I, it was very pleasantly, you know, I was very happy to know that he had uh, worked in close association with Professor Roger Penrose, uh, who received the Nobel Prize this year. In fact, on behalf of uh, PRL, uh, I extend my warm welcome to you, sir. And also, uh, I thank you very much for kindly accepting our invitation and uh, uh, agreeing to speak to us through this uh, weekly uh, colloquium uh, series of PRL. To formally uh, introduce uh, the speaker, I will now request my colleague, Professor Namit Mahajan, to please do the honors and uh, uh, and carry on the proceedings. Namit, please. Thank you, Pallam. So, friends, good afternoon. Uh, I'm sure all of us have, at some point of our uh, time in our life, have thought about the following. What happens when the sun exhausts all its fuel or a similar star dies. So, what what is the fate, final fate of such a such a such a star? And also from various popular level books, if not from uh, other sources, we many of us would have come across the word neutron stars, black holes, etc. Now, all these are in some sense related. They are the eventual fate of a star when it dies. That is when it burns out all its fuel. And there's nothing left to stop further collapse under the gravitational pull itself. And there are very, very fascinating and interesting things that happen, like uh, questions, detailed questions like, does a singularity, does, uh, do we reach a point when things become quote unquote infinite? What, what is the real structure? What are the detailed questions that one has to ask? What is the nature of such a singularity? How do quantum effects when one goes beyond general uh, theory of relativity in the classical regime, uh, impact these singularities. Today's colloquium is actually uh, around this and probably will go beyond some of these things. Uh, so today's colloquium is titled Beyond Penrose, Black Hole and Space-Time Singularities. As Pallam already mentioned, uh, this year's Nobel Prize went to uh, Genzel and Ghez for uh, observational evidence, collecting observational evidence uh, that there is a supermassive compact object at the center of our Milky Way and to Sir Roger Penrose, another half, for pioneering work, theoretical work on uh, black hole physics, space-time structure, singularities, etc. Of course, this is two years after Hawking's death, so all of the general relativists do miss Hawking very dearly. and. Uh, Incidentally, only last night, some 17, 18 hours back, uh, Penrose got his Nobel Prize medal. So it's indeed a very interesting and uh, incidentally a nice day for us to be having such a talk. And who better than Professor Pankaj Joshi, who has spent his entire life uh, career uh, looking at different aspects of gravitational collapse leading to black hole singularities, le leading to other uh, issues in collapse. So to Professor Pankaj Joshi, and f fondly we all call him Pankaj only, uh, he was a senior professor at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Bombay, before moving to Charusat University, where he founded the International uh, Center for Cosmology. And right now, he is the Vice Chancellor of Charusat University. Professor Joshi is, a, is an acclaimed and world-renowned a general relativist and a black hole theorist and in a black hole conference or a general relativity conference he would not have needed any such introduction but just to formally introduce say a few more words he is a fellow of many of the science academies and he has insa veni bapu memorial award gravity research foundation award to his uh, credit he is an excellent speaker and a very good teacher so uh, if students, even if after you have fin finished the talk, please feel free to contact him. This is an unusual situation, but otherwise 
he would have been very happy to sit with a cup of tea with all of us and keep on explaining it to us till we understand it not that he is tired of it so he's an extremely good uh, speaker uh, and that's why he was given dais cv raman lecture award he has been uh, very interested in popularizing science so he has been associated with a lot of science outreach activities and public lectures he has contributed to several books he himself has two proper books to his uh, credit one called gravitational uh, collapse and space time singularities and the other called story of collapsing stars these are very interesting books uh, the first one if i understand properly because i have looked at that one more is somewhat more technical uh, he has held several adjunct and visiting positions uh, like at cambridge harvard southampton osaka and various other places now in last couple of years the direct signature or observational evidence of gravitational waves from black hole binaries collapse uh, merger of black hole binaries black hole shadows m87 polarimetric observations has opened up a fantastically new precision era in this direction so without further ado let's hear from pankaj what he has to tell us today pankaj welcome and over to you thank you thank you very much very Ramit, much for uh, this uh, very kind uh, uh, introduction can you hear me all right uh, uh, dr parlam raju uh, yes. yes yeah we can hear okay. you yeah loud yes. thank you thank you very much namit for this very kind uh, introduction and i very warmly thank uh, the physical research laboratory uh, dr parlam raju and uh, all of you uh, Uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity to meet up with you and uh, discuss one of the uh, most uh, fascinating uh, uh, developments in uh, modern uh, astrophysics and uh, uh, cosmology which is you see the uh, final fate of massive collapsing stars in the universe and the associated phenomena like the Uh, black holes and space time singularities and uh, so on so i will uh, share my screen now and uh, <clears throat> let us just uh, uh, make sure that you can see uh, my screen uh, all right okay uh can you see the slide first slide no uh, not yet your screen yet. is not yet shared sir oh i did the sharing uh i'll 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 do it again okay can you see the screen now yes yes, okay. yes. okay so now i'll uh, go full yeah. screen yeah uh, yes you yes, can perfect. see the slide right yes. right yes very good i'll talk about collapsing stars uh, give you a brief introduction uh, the most important development that has taken place in past few decades has been i see rigorous gravitational collapse calculations that is using the general theory of relativity you try to find out what is the final fate of a massive collapsing stars and then i'll discuss black holes and singularities which are visible to far away observers and the observational and developments and finally i will allude to black hole paradoxes uh, or uh, quantum gravity connections uh, depending on the time available the most important development has been in past uh, several years several major new observational missions and facilities have come up they include you see the square kilometer array tmt 30 meter telescope ligo of course which is a famous uh, 
gravitational uh, waves detector. LISA, which is uh, a future uh, planning, the event horizon telescope and such other. The most important thing here is that uh, you see when we are launching satellites and uh, talking of space uh, close to the earth and planetary systems and so on, the Newtonian gravity works uh, pretty well actually. However, with these missions uh, such as SKY and TMT and uh, LIGO, what we are able to do now is we are now able to probe ultra strong gravity regions in the universe, which was simply impossible earlier. So that can contain completely new physics of which we are unaware as of now. And that is where the excitement lies. <coughs> this is one of the images through the Hubble uh, telescope, the lots and lots of far away galaxies spread all over the skies and whatever direction you go to. Uh, all this, uh, you see objects that you see in the picture here are different galaxies and a typical galaxy is for example, the one uh, given here, uh, the Andromeda. And one such galaxy contains some 300 to 400 billions of stars. What did I say? 300 to 400 billions of stars. And then there are billions of galaxies like this in the universe that we can already see. So this is going to the large scale structure of the universe, so to say. But then, as I said, each of the galaxies populated with stars. And then there are stars of different masses and different sizes. Our sun shown in one corner of this particular picture, you can see how tiny the sun is compared to the bigger stars like Sirius, Pollux, Arcturus and so on. So there are plenty, plenty of stars which are 10, 20, 30 uh, times the mass of the sun. They are very large stars in the universe. Now, the most interesting uh, uh, point is the life cycles of, uh, you see, sun versus the massive stars is very different uh, from uh, each other. I'll, I'll just come to that in a moment, but the picture here is on one hand, while we are talking of uh, the universe at a very large scale, we also probe the universe in very uh, small scale. The, the microcosmos versus, uh, you know, the universe of, uh, you know, microcosm and macrocosm. And there is the universe of uh, particle physics, uh, particles being accelerated in, uh, you know, with very high velocities and so on. And there are very intricate links between the uh, you know, particle physics and astrophysics, which are being discovered very rigorously as of today. But let us come back to the stars. This is a picture taken from the well-known book by Professor Kip Thorne, uh, Black Holes and Time Warps. Uh, you see, what is the typical uh, uh, sort of uh, existence of a star? Uh, it's like this, <coughs> within the star, there is a continuous uh, nuclear burning. For example, the sun is not like the solid surface, uh, which is here. Uh, we experience 
uh, on earth it is actually a, a big big ball of gas the hydrogen gas now uh, there is a nuclear process happening uh, in the sun and all the stars which are giving out heat and light and that converts fusing hydrogen atoms into helium atoms and helium uh, into other higher uh, uh, atoms uh, with the higher atomic uh, weight and so on and so forth so there is an internal pressure created because of this nuclear burning within the star and on the other hand there is a gravitational squeeze the mass entire mass of the star is creating the gravitational force which is uh, causing the uh, entire star uh, towards uh, which is the sque squeezing the entire star towards its uh, you know own center so it's like a balloon so to say you know in the balloon the air is uh, pushing outside internal pressure but the rubber is pushing inside because of its uh, uh, surface uh, tensions and so on now if you release the mouth of the balloon then air is released and then the internal pressure is gone and then the rubber squeezes the balloon to you know smaller size similarly what happens is in a star when the hydrogen is existed the helium uh, combines into higher elements and so on and so forth finally when iron is arrived at then no further uh, such nuclear fusion process is allowed and then the internal pressure of the star subsides and when that happens the gravity pulls the entire star inwards so the sun for example uh, which has lived about 5 billion years so far uh, but no worry still more 5 uh, billion years to go so we can carry out all the research on the universe or space missions that we want to conduct and so on and so forth uh, but then at the end of five more billion years the sun uh, will run out of its fuel what will happen is its outer layers will expand away and then finally what is called a white dwarf will be left this was the seminal work which uh, was done by the indian american astrophysicist professor subramaniam chandrasekhar uh, it is also known as the chandrasekhar limit a star which is below some 1.4 uh, solar masses that will become a uh, white dwarf but if the star is higher in mass say 8 to 10 solar masses and so on then in that case what will happen is that at the end of its nuclear burning the entire star will catastrophically collapse towards its center it, then there will be a shock formation uh, and this outer layers will be blasted away and finally uh, what we are left with is uh, a neutron star now this phenomenon is called a supernova explosion while a white dwarf is about a thousand kilometers in radius the neutron star is you see just uh, 10 20 kilometers in radius but it is very very compact uh, matter i mean take one full spoon of that matter and it could weigh uh, tons and tons uh, <coughs> of kilograms so this is neutron star but when you go to even higher mass stars that is stars which are uh, 
say 20, 30, 40 solar masses, then the most important point is that you cannot stop the gravitational shrinking, the gravitational collapse of this massive star. It cannot end up uh, as uh, a neutron star or even if it is a neutron star, it will still further collapse and the shrinkage will go on. And that is the regime of uh, the black holes and uh, the space-time singularity. So I hope I have made myself uh, quite clear. There are stars of different masses. The sun-like stars will become white dwarfs. The stars which are having the masses uh, of about 8 to 10 solar masses will become neutron stars. But stars which are uh, uh, more massive than that will go on shrinking further. And then what will happen to them? Uh, in fact, that is the theme uh, on which this year's uh, Nobel Prize, uh, Professor Roger Penrose's work, uh, you know, is uh, relevant. I'll just come to it. Uh, the most important uh, point is the question, what happens when a massive star dies? Now, there are very interesting intricacies and subtleties in the entire game. And they were already indicated uh, way back in 1935 by uh, Professor Chandrasekhar. Uh, this is a para taken from his uh, paper. Uh, and uh, he says that the life history of a star of small mass must be essentially different from the life history of a star of large mass. And now read the last lines. A star of large mass cannot pass into the white dwarf stage and one is left speculating on other possibilities. You mark this. At Chandrasekhar was a very meticulous, very methodical, very mathematical person. So when he says one is left speculating, so he is indicating the whole regime of unknown physics. Another very important point is the massive stars, they burn much faster and they are far more luminous. For example, I told you that the sun has lived 5 billion years, it will live uh, 5 more billion years. But a star, which is, you see, more than 10, 20, 30 solar masses, it burns very fast. And it does not live more than few crores of years. And that is why this question of final fate of uh, massive stars is huge importance in modern uh, astrophysics and uh, uh, astronomy and that is where in fact you must use not the newtonian gravity but the einstein theory i pointed out to you that we are now probing very strong gravity fields with the modern missions and that is precisely where the regime of general relativity, the strong gravity physics, everything is uh, coming into picture. And here you need the uh, general theory uh, given by Albert Einstein. General theory is of relativity is about geometry, geometry of space and time very intricate role is played by the geometry. It is also called Riemannian geometry. In fact, uh, in the general theory of relativity, the Riemannian geometry plays a big role. Uh, the curvature of space-time plays a very big role. We are familiar, of course, with cur curved surfaces, isn't it? Uh, if uh, two ends walk, you know, in the direction of their eyesight test, looking straight in the direction of their nose, 
then they will never meet they will go on and on however if they are on the surface of uh, a sphere then even if uh, they are walking parallel according to you know their own local measurements that is walking straight still they are bound to meet because of the curvature of the space time and on the other hand <coughs> if you have a saddle like surface then rather than meeting even when they are parallel going they will move away from each other there are very exciting and intricate features of the general theory of relativity that when you go to very small scales of particle physics uh, you see the large hadron collider i showed you uh, just before a moment then this is what is called the space time foam an idea introduced by john wheeler but right now we do not go into that i will just show you that in recent years einstein theory has uh, created the excitement on black holes the big bang the gravitational waves multiverses that is is there one universe or many time warps time travel space time singularities naked singularities uh, i will talk about uh, uh, you see the singularities which are visible as opposed to uh, being within a black hole okay so so far what i was telling you was that when you want to study the gravitational collapse the inevitable shrinkage of a massive star under its own gravity then you must use general theory of relativity because it is a very strong gravity regime the first such work was done by uh, robert oppenheimer and his uh, student schneider there was also a paper from within india by one professor dat uh, from presidency college calcutta they studied the gravitational collapse as scenarios but it was a very simple model of a star they assumed that the density in the entire star is completely constant then the star is completely spherical it is made of dust that is they assumed that the pressure within the star uh, to be zero no rotation etc now why they made so many assumptions they made so many assumptions because the einstein equations are very complicated to deal with einstein equations uh, is not an easy task uh, some of you who may be the students of sciences or mathematics i can tell that they are second order non linear partial differential equations non linear itself is scary partial differential equations are scary as opposed to ordinary differential equations and so on and so forth so to do the general relativity uh, calculations they made all this uh, <coughs> assumptions but they came up with very interesting uh, conclusions in their paper in 1939 uh, i see on right hand side there is a 3d picture of the star the star is shrinking shrinking but as the star shrinks uh its gravitational force becomes very strong on the surface of the star so finally what happens is an event horizon forms as the star keeps shrinking and what is event horizon it is a surface from which not even the light can escape you see if you want to escape the surface of the earth you know that the rocket must have what is called an escape velocity which is usually few kilometers uh, per second but if you want to escape the compact star which has shrunk which i am showing here light which is traveling 
<clears throat> one lakh and you know eighty-six thousand kilometers in one second, <clears throat> even light cannot escape. Once it has, you see, arrived this horizon stage. So this was the kind of uh, picture that Oppenheimer and Schneider uh, predicted. And in the end, what will happen? In the end, what will happen is the star will shrink to a space-time singularity, which is shown in the left-hand uh, uh, picture. Uh, <clears throat> this space-time singularity is, uh, uh, you see, a regime where densities are extremely high. All the matter of star is compacted in infinitesimally small region. And then around this is this region which is shown in black, which is the black hole region. Uh, that is, uh, you see this picture uh, that I show on left is space-time picture. Uh, as shown at the top, you see the vertical direction is that of time. The, and the horizontal axis is that of space. So the entire star is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking as you move uh, forward in time. So this was the first discovery of, so to say, the black hole. Now, <coughs> the uh, term black hole was not known at that time. Uh, this term came only later uh, when John Wheeler gave this particular term. But Einstein himself, you see, was unhappy with this kind of a picture. He said a star can never contract like this. Uh, this is ridiculous. He himself wrote a paper uh, telling that this is not correct. Uh, this is wrong. But then Einstein himself made many mistakes in his life. And this was another mistake that he made here. In fact, Einstein was incorrect. And Oppenheimer and Schneider were correct. But the master has spoken uh, and therefore there was no activity for another 20-30 years in the field. But then in 1960s there was a huge resurgence of interest because quasars, radio galaxies and several very high energy phenomena were discovered in the universe. Now, this were so, such high energy phenomena really that no known uh, forces, the nuclear physics and so on will explain such a big generation of energy. So then people suddenly remembered that, ah, you see the Oppenheimer and Schneider uh, work, they had shown this black hole and the very strong gravity regime and maybe uh, it is the black hole uh, which was shown by Oppenheimer and Schneider which is doing all this. Anyway, they had no escape. There was nothing else they could have done. But the point is there was a resurgence of interest in 1960s. And that is where a lot of work was done by John Wheeler, Roger Penrose, Stephen Hawking, Kip Thorne and others. The... Nobel Prize to Roger Penrose was given, in fact, for the singularity theorem that Penrose gave in 1965. So you see, I was telling you about the resurgence of interest, 1960s. So the work was actually done in 1965, the Penrose singularity theorem. But further to this, a huge investigation happened in classical and quantum aspects of black holes, the Hawking uh, radiation, so on and so forth. Interesting thermodynamic analogies, astrophysical applications. Uh, but what I want to remind you is only one calculation in general relativity was available when all this happened. Which calculation? The calculation by Oppenheimer and Schneider. And that was a gravitational collapse model with many, many special assumptions, as I told you. 
So then, as I will tell you in a moment, people thought that every star will be become a black hole like this. Okay? Remember what I am telling. You have a very special model available, Oppenheimer and Schneider with many, many assumptions. It was giving rise to a black hole, but then people assumed that every star will become black hole and then a lot of exploration on black hole physics was made. This is an artist conception, uh, as I as I already as I already uh, told you, as I already told you, there is a singularity at the center of the uh, black hole. You see, this is a picture. Uh, you can see at the center there is singularity, and then there is event horizon. I showed you, and then there is a photon sphere uh, out there. All these things are uh, showing you the structure of the black hole. And then people uh, thought that uh, at the center of galaxies, the black holes are powering uh, a very high energy phenomenon. Uh, and uh, this is one such jet shown from the center of black holes. But we come to the recent developments now. Uh, just to summarize what I told you so far, again, <clears throat> you have a stellar nebula. If you have average star like sun, it will become uh, finally at the end of its life cycle, red giant, planetary nebula and white dwarf. If you have a large star, massive star, then super red giant, supernova, and either it is neutron star, if the mass is something like 8 to 10 solar masses, the mass of the star. And if it is larger than that, then people thought, and I emphasis, uh, I emphasize that people thought or people assume that the large mass star will become a black hole. So, the mathematical, theoretical, our fundamental question still remained open. You had one special model only, namely the Oppenheimer and Schneider model. But if you have a general enough star, will that also become a black hole? So that remained unanswered, even when a lot of developments were happening in 1960s. Namely, according to general relativity, what will be the final fate of a big, massive, collapsing star? And that is where, again, Roger Penrose came in. He gave a conjecture or a hypothesis that any star collapse makes a black hole only. But mind you, this is a conjecture. This is an assumption. This is a hypothesis. He said that just like the Oppenheimer-Schneider model, maybe, maybe all stars will collapse to black hole and hiding the final singularity. And that final singularity was the work of uh, Roger Penrose. Uh, there are many, many exciting stories, uh, uh, you know, of that era. The big fights between the Russians and the uh, Hawking, Penrose, uh, and the American scientists, and so on. The Russians were telling that such singularities will never form. But then finally, Penrose showed that, uh, you know, through very rigorous mathematical for, uh, theorems, that the singularity must form. But then, again, a very subtle point general relativity implies, see, what we know from the work of Penrose, Hawking, by Robert Garrock in USA, what we know, general relativity implies that under reasonable physical conditions, the massive star collapses into a space-time singularities. Okay? But what we do not know is whether, just like the Oppenheimer-Schneider scenario, whether the event horizon will form and cover and hide the singularity. So again, the question is, we know that the massive star makes a space-time singularity. 
but then at as i said here at the bottom are this singularities of collapse covered always within the event horizon or they could be uh, visible to far away observers and this is uh, one of the most important uh, open issues in modern physics uh, modern gravitation physics and astrophysics and black hole physics uh, today uh, roger penrose was a good friend uh, has been a good friend uh, this is one of uh, our pictures i met him first time actually in uh, pittsburgh in the uh, usa and i still remember our first meeting i asked him a question uh, and you see immediately he immersed into a deep thought he was looking somewhere you see uh, he was in deep thought and uh, for almost a minute he was very silent uh and then he slowly he started answering my question but you see those uh, 60 seconds or those uh, 50 seconds was kind of like you know ik pal beete jaise ik jug beeta so uh, you know <clears throat> it was a very long time for me but you know it showed his you see depth uh, depth of his vision depth of his mind how you know uh, deeply uh, he would uh, uh, think on any uh, given problem all right uh, cutting the long story short in past uh, several years after the you know 1960s later especially in 1980s the scientists including myself and uh, uh my students collaborators and others many many calculations were done uh of more complicated gravitational collapse models see in a typical star uh, the oppenheimer schneider like assumptions will not hold typically the density will be higher at the center in a realistic star they will have internal pressures Uh, then you know the actual stars will rotate so more complicated gravitational collapse models were worked out by us uh, worked out by me and my collaborators and what we showed is that sometimes the event horizon covers the singularity but at other times it does not now let me be explicit when the star let me give you an example when the star is completely homogeneous like oppenheimer schneider model the event horizon will cover the singularity however assume that the uh, density is higher at center which is typically the case you see aap bhi you know if you go deeper into the crust of the earth uh, towards its center तो जो डेंसिटी है वो इंक्रीज होगी और वहां एट द सेंटर द डेंसिटी विल बी हाईएस्ट तो इन अ रियलिस्टिक स्टार आल्सो इट इज सिमिलर थिंग द डेंसिटी इज हाईएस्ट एट द सेंटर एंड स्लोली डिक्रीजेस सो व्हाट वी शोड वाज दैट व्हेन द डेंसिटी इज हायर एट द सेंटर इन दैट केस व्हेन यू वर्क आउट द ग्रेविटेशनल कॉलप्स मॉडल यूजिंग द आइंस्टाइन थ्योरी देन this curtain of event horizon is no longer covering the space time singularity such a singularity was called by roger penrose as a naked singularity i don't like this word naked singularity in fact i like to call it you know just a singularity which is visible so this words like naked singularities cosmic censorship etc uh, hindered the progress of physics for some time uh, but the point is as more and more calculations started coming out then uh, people realized that uh, uh, the uh, both cases are possible singularities covered within horizons the others which are not in the uh, favor of time uh, 
saving i will not go into the detail of the calculations but basically we work out using the einstein equations when the event horizons are forming and when they are uh, able to cover the singularity when they are not uh, able to cover uh, the uh, singularity the these are some of this uh, what are called space time diagrams if there are any questions then i will uh, come back to it but you see this is the black hole picture where nothing it's a space time diagram again time is vertical and uh, the uh, uh, the horizontal is uh, the radial uh, part so this is a black hole scenario but here is a naked singularity scenario where there are outgoing light rays uh, you see away from the singularity uh this is just telling that there are many many models which have been worked out by now in einstein theory and we have published many papers and internationally uh, from cambridge from princeton uh, from harvard many places lots of models now have been worked out of gravitational collapse and then what we find is that when a real physical star is collapsing depending on the internal structure of the star a typically a visible singularity is developing here are few more equations but i would rather like to devote more time to the observational uh, aspects of the whole game uh, therefore i do not go into the mathematical details what i am trying to tell you basically is that depending on the internal structure of the star either you have a naked singularity forming or a black hole uh, developing uh, out of the let me not go into this details of how many black holes form and how many visible singularities form but uh, if you see the uh, space of functions typically both have equal probability uh, of forming namely the black holes and the visible singularities Hello. I think there is some. Uh, hello, some. Some problem. Yes. I think Bhagat Joshi has lost him. Yeah, we lost him. Yeah. 
some some internet so connection like his, on his problem. side we just okay. lost him we just you know probably we can call him once and
Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Now I think some uh, for some reason I think we, our call got uh, not disconnected there. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah. You may please. Uh, you know. Uh, continue. Okay. Uh, probably I think the way the the, the point where uh, got disconnected is. Uh, You you are yeah. talking about the both the singularities, you know. That's where it got disconnected. I think slide number thirty-seven. Okay, okay, thirty-seven is it? Yeah, 37. yeah. You, men you, you mentioned that you will you will now spend some time on interesting observational aspects. You oh, didn't want okay. to get into and the, and the two kind of singularities you are showing. Right, right, right. I'll 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 go back there. Uh, Okay, can you see my slide now? Hello? Uh, yes, yes, it's coming. Yeah, 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 we can see. You can see? Yes. yes. Now I'll go down. You tell me where I. Uh, This, I think, one previous. No, no, previous. Two, two slides previous. Okay, here. Two, uh, one more back. One. Two, yeah. Back. Yeah, yeah, somewhere here. Yes. No, somewhere forward. Here. Yeah, I know. Yeah, forward actually. Forward. Two. Forward. Is it okay? Yeah, no, yeah, one, one. Yeah, one, yeah this yeah, one. Cross. Yeah. Previous, previous. Just uh, one back. Okay, this one. One more. One more goes. Yeah, one more. Yes. Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, okay, but now you can hear me all right. Yes, yes, and you can see my slides also. Sorry, I was my attention was away from the phone, but in case of any problem, please call me again. Huh? Okay, okay, so okay, I was just I was just telling you that uh, these are the mathematical formalisms. Uh, uh, the typically the uh, you see, yeah, this is this is slide thirty-seven. Yes, as uh, Bushit Ji was telling, right. Typically, you know what will happen is uh, both black holes and visible singularities will occur. Let me not go into the uh, mathematical detail. Uh, you see, as opposed to the earlier paradigm, where uh, you see, here you had uh, average star going to a white dwarf and a large mass star going to a black hole kind of a thing. Now you have a new paradigm where what is happening is the heavyweight star will go to either a black hole or and exploding a fireball okay so this is a change in paradigm so to say and now uh, can you see and can you hear me hello yes yes both right yes yes okay. yes we can see the slide okay very good very good so you see i was showing you this paradigm and then uh, here uh, what happened was, as I said, the whole uh, question is very, very interesting and exciting in the field of uh, modern astrophysics and gravitation physics. So it was a big deal when Stephen Hawking accepted that, yes, the visible or uh, the naked singularities can develop. And then that became uh, the New York Times first page. Uh, article uh, actually when, when he accepted that uh, uh, you know visible singularity can occur i was invited uh, before a few years to write a review article by the well known 150 years old us magazine scientific american and uh, uh, 
the bonus was it became their international cover story translated in more than uh, 20 uh, international languages and here is the german uh, cartoon which the editor gave uh, for those of you who can read german you see the editor is uh, asking cosmism censor and the scientists are discussing whether then event horizon should really form or not uh, a book was written by an american lawyer la pawa a naked singularity and this is actually on uh, american uh, judicial system and this is also being made into a movie the movie must be out i think any time uh, an actor angela shelton uh, said i don't want to become a black hole i want to be like a rebel star escaping away from a black hole all right away from uh, this uh, social uh, waves that this whole issue uh, created basically i was coming to the last part of my talk namely you see the astrophysic uh, astrophysicists ask that uh, all right i mean be there you know visible singularities or black holes whatever how are we going to see uh, these objects uh, out there in the uh, skies so give us observational signatures and uh, what are the observational uh, implications can we really distinguish out there in the skies this black holes from uh, the visible singularities so there i was uh, uh, you know uh, this slide is telling you that there are many approaches like accretion disk properties around the black hole and singularities very high energy particle collisions gravitational lensing around these objects the shadows around black holes and uh, the singularities so i'll touch upon two things you see the accretion disk and the shadows uh, there are many other exciting things but in the interest of time i'll not touch them be it a singularity or a black hole there is an accreting matter disk swirling around the object and that is called an accretion disk this is another picture of the same thing in falling material and there is a jet now we calculated uh, the emissions thermal emissions from accretion disk in the case of a black hole and in the case of a naked singularity in uh, collaboration with daniel malafarina and ramesh narayan at harvard we have several other papers in this series uh, a most recent one uh, published just a few days ago the most salient feature was that <coughs> in the case of a black hole as you can see the dotted line the emission stops beyond a certain frequency there is no uh, emission thermal emission from the disk at higher frequencies however in the case of a naked singularity you have emissions in much higher uh, frequencies uh, as shown by the horizontal uh, curves in the upper a uh, portion of the uh, figure uh, i will not touch upon this other things but the point important point that i am making is that when the singularities are visible are these objects like quantum stars where actually quantum effects as well as the gravitational effects are combining together in order to give you uh, an altogether new signature of quantum gravity this is very very important because the string theories today 
are incomplete the loop quantum gravity has their own problems so what i am trying to tell you or what I, the this particular development is telling physicists is that hello hello yes sir you are audible yes we can hear you you are audible and slide is also seen uh, but it's not in the full screen mode oh i see earlier it was visible something happened uh something i see uh okay okay uh okay uh, can you see it hello we can we can see your screen now uh, we can see adobe adobe flash player or something i see uh i think i should reconnect again uh, this has to do with i think this uh, can you see me now yes your screen is visible now if you open the slides uh let me let me rejoin again i think because it is showing all sorts of things uh uh can you see my can you see the screen now yes yes we see the slides now you see the slides yes <coughs> okay so i'll i think i think it's it's a glitch with the software itself so i'll uh, i think uh, just uh, continue uh, what i was telling you was this now you can see uh, and hear me right yes yes good so i was telling you that the string theories are uh, incomplete the uh, loop quantum gravity has its own limitations so what i am telling is this particular physics development is uh, telling us very important things uh, it can give you uh, important quantum gravity uh, signatures really and as uh, bob wald pointed out if the censorship fails then in a literal sense we would come face to face with the laws of quantum gravity whenever gravitational collapse to a naked singularity occurs in distant regions of our universe so that's an exciting possibility if you wanted to create uh, you know a quantum gravity lab just as we created the large hadron collider and that will be impossible uh, we won't have money to create uh, that kind of a lab however the nature would have or could have given us a quantum a gravity lab if the singularity were visible and now let me just come to the very final uh, uh, part of my talk we want to observe the galactic center and that is the other part of the uh, nobel prize this year uh, the compact objects at the center of gravity uh, sorry at the center of the uh, galaxies like andromeda our own galaxy and so on this is m87 uh, kind of an object galactic center so they connected different uh, telescopes uh, radio telescopes all over the earth and then uh, this is an artist depiction 
they expected to see this kind of a shadow uh, at the galactic center another picture of the shadow so here again the singularities as well as black holes create their own shadows and there are a lot of activities our own group here uh, the Panjan Day and uh, our students, uh, Parth Bamanya and Ashok Joshi and uh, others have been uh, doing a lot of work on the shadows uh, recently. What the singularity will create, what the black hole will create, what are the comparisons, so on and so forth. Many of these details are given in my uh, Oxford uh, uh, semi popular uh, title The Story of Collapsing Stars. Uh, sorry to check it again, but I hope you can see it uh, and you can hear me. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So, here are the two black holes uh, collapsing and merging. These are two very compact objects, be they black holes, be they singularities, whatever. And LIGO Observatory in Livingston and uh, other places uh, caught some signals of the merger of these two uh, very compact objects. By the way, I wanted to mention that uh, India has a good uh, lineage in the picture here the person with a cap is uh, professor pc vaidya who was uh, very much in ahmedabad all his life and his work is internationally well known as vaidya metric we have used it a lot the other person is professor a.r rao a mathematician who lived uh, 101 years and when he was 100 years I heard his seminar at the Central Salt and Marine Chemicals Research, a CSIR laboratory in Baunagar. Here is Kip Thorn. Uh, we met at the Goa conference uh, discussing gravitational collapse. I asked him about the importance of the gravitational collapse studies, and he was extremely supportive, telling me that uh, it's a very important subject and then he also wrote uh, for the back cover of my Cambridge monograph uh, gravitational collapse and space-time singularities so in a in his lecture at Bangalore <clears throat> couple of years ago uh, he said that uh, what will be the gravitational waves forms uh, he, this is the picture. Kip Thorne is shown in the, uh, you know, side uh, box uh, up there. So he said that from a black hole, the waveforms, uh, gravitational waveforms will be of certain nature. But then Kip Thorne asked that what if the central body is not a black hole? For example, a naked singularity. Now, Kip Thorne asking such a question has a lot of importance as compared to Pankaj Joshi uh, giving a seminar uh, in India uh, because he's a well known figure. And you know, when he is asking about naked singularity, everybody's attention is drawn. Uh, and then he said that in that case, the waveforms will be very, very different. Here you can see uh, Kip Thorne much more vividly. So he was telling us that uh, uh, you can distinguish the black holes uh, uh, and uh, the uh, naked singularities and a lot of new physics uh, will be discovered by the gravitational waves in the uh, future uh, decades. So with that, I think I uh, end my talk. I have told you the <coughs> fate of massive stars I have told you the <clears throat> observe theoretical developments. I have told you several observational developments. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very exciting. There are many papers that we have been uh, writing, working, 
both in national and international collaborations. And I was just telling uh, Namit and uh, Professor Raju that uh, in, in local regions, wherever there are good institutions, uh, we all should uh, start collaborating, discussing, and uh, collaboration is the way forward. So with that, I think I uh, complete my talk. Once again, I thank you all very warmly. Uh, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I will be happy to talk about and answer. Thanks a lot, Professor Joshi, for a wonderfully simplified talk on black holes, such a difficult subject. So uh, questions are welcome. Uh, Pankaj, uh, already during the talk, there was one small question from Dr. A.B. Bhatt. Uh, the question mm -hmm. was, is what about possibility of a black hole being made of antimatter only? Uh, we know uh, as of now very little uh, on the properties of uh, uh, antimatter and uh, its uh, gravitational collapse properties. Uh, but I have no idea whether the dark energy can mimic in any way the antimatter uh, uh, properties. Uh, but this is a purely conjectural uh, possibility. We have to do a lot more work using the Einstein gravity uh, on such possibilities. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Uh, there's another one, Pankaj. Uh, Bhushit has flashed it on your screen also. I'll also read. Yeah, 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 How does read. the new gravitational collapse models account for the rotation of star, account the rotation of star into the formation of naked singularity? It's a very good. And what are... Ah, yes. Yeah. Tell me. No, no, no. You can answer that. Then there's another question from Naval Bhandari. Okay. He has to... Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, as I was mentioning to you, the gravitational models which have been uh, studied uh, so far are mainly spherically symmetric model, but uh, there are also other models which have been explored, which have, uh, uh, which are not spherically symmetric and which can incorporate a small uh, rotation. So basically, uh, if the rotation is very small, uh, it will be a black hole. But if the rotation of the final configuration is large enough, then that will be a naked singularity. There is a limit on uh, uh, the rotation parameter, actually, in the Einstein theory. So we need more studies on uh, rotating gravitational collapse models. Right now, what we know is that uh, both uh, black holes and uh, uh, naked singularity formation is uh, occurring under fairly uh, physically reasonable uh, scenarios. Okay. okay. So, Naval, this was the question from Naval. He has another question. He's mm -hmm. saying, what are your views on the formation of wormholes? Uh, will it be necessary for them to form at places of high gravity regions? Uh, I will answer the second part first. Uh, definitely, uh, the formation will take place in uh, uh, high gravity regions, typically. All these objects such as the black holes, the wormholes, the singularities, uh, as I was emphasizing in my talk, these are the uh, happenings in the very strong gravity regions. Uh, 
whereas we know on the formation of naked singular it is for sure that they will uh, happen uh, for sure out of gravitational collapse models we do not know whether the wormholes can uh, be the final states of uh, gravitational collapse what i mean to say is we do not know their actual production mechanism so they are available as uh, solutions to einstein equations but we have no idea if uh, they can form out of any physically reasonable processes see in my whole talk the emphasis was on the physical process of gravitational collapse so whether gravitational collapse can cause wormholes or not uh, that is not at all answered so we do not know whether uh, wormholes can uh, form out of physical processes whereas the visible singularities and black holes can form at least from at least from physical uh, physically observable processes in the universe i mean very very reasonable thing you know to uh, see massive stars are bound to collapse at the end of their life uh, life cycles so either the black hole or a visible singularity has to happen there is uh, one phone in question there someone uh, dr sp gupta just called up he is wants to he says that he kind of remembers roger penrose interview wherein uh, wherein it seems he alluded to many big bangs happening many you know not just you know so what are what is what he wants to know if you have some uh, insights onto that yes he, uh, roger penrose has a very interesting theory actually which he calls a conformal uh, cosmology uh, so he he does not uh, advocate a single big bang as uh, has been uh, uh, predicted by the friedman models but in last few years uh, he is talking about so called uh, hawking uh, spots hawking sites and uh, you see a scalar field uh, really developing eventually uh, as the, as the current expansion of the universe uh, you know entire universe converting into a scalar field and then again that is the start of another universe so he he calls it a conformal uh, cosmology uh, again a field which has not drawn uh, up till now a lot of attention from cosmologists cosmologists as of today swear by the big bang cosmology and the dark matter and dark energy and so on so it will take uh, some time really uh, for this uh, new ideas of uh, penrose in fact uh, you see i am i am a little bit uh, intrigued about uh, the nobel committee citation also of uh, uh, for uh, the, the prize for penrose really the prize has been you know for, for his profound work on space time singularities that is where he contributed uh, very profoundly and i am extremely happy that the prize has come to the theoretical work uh, the connection with the galactic center object and uh, black holes and so on is uh, somewhat uh, tenuous in the sense that uh, he neither predicted the the formation of black holes he did give a conjecture and uh, we have a lot of evidence on the existence of very compact strong gravity objects at the center of galaxies in the universe and so on but there is a raging debate actually as to the nature of this object their physics and so on and so forth uh, but all all in all i am in a great happening i am i am delighted roger penrose uh, is getting this prize and that is why the entire subject is getting lot more attention so that means our work also getting more attention 
So, nothing to lose. There's, there's a question from Shashi Kiran Ganesh. He's asking, what is our understanding regarding the formation of supermassive black holes, for example, found in the center of the galaxies? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Actually, we know a lot about the formation of ordinary black holes. By ordinary black holes, I mean black holes with a mass of 20, 30, 10 solar masses and so on and so forth. It's an absolute mystery how a very, very large black hole can form. Such as the one at the such as the one at the uh, center uh, of uh, a galaxy. So uh, it's, it's the theory for the same is completely unknown actually. How, how you will end up accreting millions and billions of solar masses uh, and whether the event horizon will form there. That is precisely the reason why the event horizon telescope uh, has been designed we want to understand the physics happening there actually uh, and lot and lot of physics is uh, hidden in this uh, images uh, the black hole shadows so called shadows of the compact objects at the central regions of the galaxies but how this uh, mass got affected? Again, it's the physics of gravitational collapse I have been emphasizing. So you have to study the gravitational collapse within the Einstein theory much more carefully to understand the formation of such supermassive black holes. But forget the word black holes. What uh, Professor Ramesh Narayan, for example, tells is that the concentration of a lot of matter in some very compact region of space is astrophysical black hole, whether the event horizon is there or not. It, it could be a visible singularity. So actually, I like to I like to say that don't call this naked singularities and, you know, drive people away. Call them black holes without horizons and everyone will be very happy. Because there are a lot of matter compacted in, uh, you know, that region. So, yes, so that is about supermassive. So, Supriyo Chakravarti then has a... Uh, short question. What what are the evidences of Hawking points as claimed by Penrose? Uh, these are very intriguing uh, uh, possibilities, I would say. Uh, and, but uh, they are conjectural uh, and uh, uh, they are possible explanations of, again, some mysteries uh, such as the dark energy or the conformal uh, cosmology being talked about Penrose in which, you know, these Hawking points will play some role. But again, the observational uh, indications are, as of now, very minimal. So Hawking radiation, for example, a lot of excitement, a lot of theoretical work, but eventually uh, we have to see it observation. And that is very, very faint, uh, 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 what shall I say, uh, very difficult to get the evidence unless the black hole explodes at the very end point of its life, which is again uh, very much like a naked singularity. Uh, people have written papers that at the end point of the Hawking radiation of a black hole uh, will be again, a visible a singularity. So it's a speculative uh, conjecture as of today. Uh, but like uh, many other things, uh, people will investigate uh, this thing in some more. So there are two more questions. One is from Sunal Desai. Uh, can we have some upper limit for supermassive black holes? Well, uh, theoretically, uh, black hole mass could be anything. Uh, 
you can have a lot of mass compacted in a very small region, but from within general theory of relativity, you can have uh, black holes with uh, very, very large masses. The only uh, limit would be the supply of matter available. So only from the supply that is available, you can, you know, do that much. But otherwise, there are even talk of, you see, the entire universe being a black hole. I mean, some, you know, conjectures or the possibilities are like that. In that case, you have, you see, the black hole of the size of uh, or mass of the universe. But what I'm trying to say is, theoretically, there is no. Okay, Pankaj, this one is a somewhat more technical question. Uh, Sandeep Kumar Raut is asking to detect thermal radiation from naked singularity at higher frequency as in your 2013 paper, dense matter needs to be present inside the ISCO. How is it possible? A very, very interesting question. In fact, uh, uh, I would uh, request uh, Sandeep uh, to have a look at our paper. I will explain it here also in some detail. But we actually worked out the stable circular orbits around both black hole and uh, uh, the singularity. Now, there is a very important difference in the case of black hole and in the case of a naked singularity. For black holes <clears throat> below 6m, there are no stable circular orbits available. And then there is a free fall, so to say, into the black hole. However, in the naked singularity space-time geometry, you have stable circular orbits existing very close to the center. And this is the key result of our paper. So because of this stable circular orbits going very close to the singularity, we can calculate the... A thermal emission so the what i in in other words the accretion disk is going very close to the singularity uh, the stable circular orb, orbits as opposed to the black hole and that is why when you calculate the, the radiation from there uh, so in in other words the theoretically the innermost stable circular orbit in the case of a naked singularity is uh, close to zero radius as opposed to the 6m in the Schwarzschild case. So this is the, so the, the, the existence of stable circular orbits themselves is very, very intriguing for the case of, uh, you see, the naked singularity metric. And this is the major part of our paper, because unless you have that, there is no question of working out the radiation from out there. Yes, a very, very interesting question. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be any other question till now. Mm -hmm. Okay, if not, we are very happy that even after the small glitch, we could reconnect and we could complete the talk. So thank you, Professor Joshi again, and for a very wonderful talk and uh, any student or any other uh, participant, if there are questions related to black holes, general relativity or other things, uh, please feel free to contact Professor Joshi. As I said, he's very, very happy to generally uh, get in discussion, explain things. So please get back to him. Uh, you could find his email address or contact number by Googling. And on a lighter note, if you Google Pankaj Joshi, you'll find a namesake from Indore, a boy who is actually a TikTok star with 8.5 million followers. So don't send a mail to that guy. He may send you back some videos. So thank you, Pankaj, again, and for a very nice talk. And over to Palam now. Yes, thank you, Namit, uh, for, 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 uh, for handling this and uh, so nicely. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, uh, Pankaj Joshi ji. Aapne very nicely you have put things, such a complex and difficult topic. You really tried to uh, uh, 
uh, you know, you put it in such a nice form. And uh, we're really, uh, really extremely grateful to you uh, again uh, to, to, uh, to for doing this uh, task and being with us here. And we'll definitely like to, you know, have more in-person interactions in the near uh, future as soon as things become safer for everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, very happy, delighted to meet uh, all of you uh, uh, through this medium. And uh, uh, it's such a great pleasure uh, meeting uh, with uh, Namit, uh, Dr. Palam Raju, all of you. Uh, thank you very much again uh, for this uh, great opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye bye. It's bye. our pleasure bye. always. Yes. Thank bye you. bye. Bye. Before bye. yeah, before we close, uh, it, it's a pleasant uh, you know duty of me to announce the next uh, week's colloquium. We come from black holes to closer by a little bit. We'll have a talk by Professor Dipankar uh, Banerjee, uh, uh, Director uh, Aries Nanital. He's going to talk to us on uh, long-term study of the sun using Kodai Canal digitized archive. So we all, I, I request you all to, you know, please join us again uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, same time uh, for yet another, uh, you know, uh, uh, informative talk. Uh, thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Take care and uh, stay safe.